ultimately money is psychology, right? It motivates people, it demotivates people, it gives people anxiety. If we could take the emotion out of it, it would be so easy. Victoria Devine, welcome to Straight Talk. I just had this grand assumption that the second you became an adult and you got an adult job, everything sorted itself out. That's why I'm so wildly passionate about making finances more approachable and more accessible because we deserve that education. Home ownership is becoming further out of reach. I do not know people in my demographic who earn average salaries, who could afford a stay-at-home wife, a mortgage, 2.5 kids and a dog. That is no longer the reality. I, I actually adore the space and I'm sure you do too. Well, I love it. I love it because it makes me money. But uh... <laughs> Victoria Devine, welcome to Straight Talk, finally. Thank you for having me. I feel like it has been a long road to get to this chair. Yeah, totally. Uh, well, should have spoken to you a long time ago because we're sort of in the same game a little bit. I'm more uh, monoline in that I just have a product and I sell mortgages, but I sort of get dragged into the financial environment every now and then, especially when it comes to interest rates. Um, but you're, that's your full go. It is my full gamut. I feel yeah. like all we do is mortgages. I mean, I can't I can't say that I write mortgages. I'm sure you're not sitting down anymore writing the no, loans and seeing I, clients. Well, I can tell you straight up, I've never written a mortgage. You've so never want, written a mortgage? I've, neither have I, I've my friend. I've taken plenty out, but I haven't uh, written a mortgage. I have people who do it for me, like a couple of thousand for that matter, across Australia. But, uh, but I do know what the credit process is because I had to familiarise myself with that when we started running our own product. So... A couple of thousand. I'm sitting here going, well, um, I have five. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but you probably make more money than me because the couple of thousand just means I've got a lot more expenses and a lot more support around it. But, uh, yeah, I know we, we do like two billion a month. It are you, are you crazy? Like that is, we are on track at the moment and we're really open about this, right? We're on track as a small business to probably do about 400 or 500 million this year as, as a very small team. But that's pretty and good. And our goal, right? Because I think that, as you would know, mortgage broking is a space that is very male dominated. And when you see females in it, it's actually a really good career for like mums coming back to work, right? Like mm. you can be incredibly flexible. Mm. So if women are in it, I feel like there's this perception that maybe they're not as much of a powerhouse as man, like they're not smashing it out. And so Kate, who is my business partner and I in the mortgage broking sector, we want to be able to create a billion dollar a year business. And then you're sitting here saying, oh, we just do two bill a month. It's all good. And I'm like, our 10 year plan is to be a billion dollar annual business. And you're just like, oh, monthly, that's all good. Yeah. Well, but, but, yeah, but I've been out a Just a little time. flex. I've just been a out little a long flex. time though. Like, uh, and I, I guess I've been a long time and like, you know, we've invested a lot of money into it. So, but I, but that's interesting in what you say about women and mortgages. Um, we have some women in our organization who do mortgages, who, who have branches, have, have their own franchise and, and or operate out of some other aggregators. Well, we're an aggregator, some other brokers platforms. Like yeah. we, we're an aggregator as well. And um, I'll be honest with you that they're some of our best lenders or the best brokers, mortgage brokers that we have in our whole organisation. We have a couple of guys who shoot the lights out a bit only because they've been around a lot longer and uh, and have a better, probably a better client referral list. But some of the women, particularly in Victoria, they're bloody fantastic. It's actually the expectation versus the reality of it, right? I feel like you also get different experiences with different brokers. So men are often more likely to be clean about the process, get it done, where women are a little bit more emotional about it. And I feel like have those deep connections with clients who maybe aren't as set on their goals or aren't as set on making sure that things are happening in a way that the client's super, super comfortable, right? Like there's just more follow-up. So it's different and it's interesting to see how men versus women function in that space because I know people in both, but I, I actually adore the space and I'm sure you do too. Well, I love it. I love it because it makes me money. But uh, <laughs> I, but I love talking about, I'm, I'm sort of obsessed with interest rates. I'm obsessed with what the RBA is or isn't doing and I'm obsessed with telling everyone about it. I mean, what did, what did you think about last Tuesday's 25 base point interest rate rise that the RBA governor put in, the, put into us? Like I'll make it sound like he shot a bullet into us, but... What do you think about the last 25 base points? It felt like we were being kicked while we're down. So the space that I really work in at this point in time is that first home buyer space. So not a lot of our clients are, you know, buying their second or third properties at this point. Hopefully they grow up with us. However, I saw it coming. I was reading some I was reading some research from, you know, CBA said it's definitely going to happen. A lot of economists were like, they're not going to do it. They're not going to do it. But 
past behavior, while it doesn't predict future performance, like it's happened so many times that when it happened, I wasn't surprised. Um, I don't think it's going to continue on that way, but it just, it feels like a bit of a kick while you're down. And when we're talking about, I guess, young people who've just got their mortgages or young people who are trying to get into the market, those, that 25 basis point increase doesn't just mean, oh my gosh, your mortgage repayments have increased. It actually pushes the bar a little bit further away for people wanting to borrow because it brings down your lending capacity. So when you're already budgeting and already scraping by with your home deposit, it's just that little bit more of a stretch further. So for me in my community, I feel like it was a really big hit. And then the week after it was announced that indexation on HEX was 7.1. They really had to throw that 0.1 in there and they're like round it down, my friends, like have some level of empathy, but I feel like all of that seems to be piling on to our community and they're feeling a little bit disheartened by it. So for me, it's different when it's personal versus when it's for my community. For me, I was like, okay, well, you know, look at my mortgages at some point. But for my community, I just know that that level of disenchantment is just increasing on the daily. That, that hex thing you just mentioned, that's pretty important. That's critical to me. Um, hex used to go up by, you know, less than 1% per annum. Um, now it's going out by the CPI um, and it's sort of like becoming an interest rate. It's it's, yeah. it's sort of being, it's like, it's index. So whatever your hex set is, it gets indexed once a year. It's, but if the indexation is 0.1, that's no big deal or half a percent or but it's n- nothing really. So the debt sort of remains fairly stable. But now it's going up at 7% per annum clip. That's when you do that every year because it's next year to be, let's say it's 7% again, it'll be 7% on 107%. Yeah. So it's going to go up, you know, like more than It's just going to feel like it's compounding, right? It's compounding. And compounding can, over a 15-year period, I think I calculated the other day, that at its current 6.5% can actually make your debt 100% of what it was. Yeah. Um, how, do you, what, policy-wise, what do you think? What would you say to the government policy-wise about that? Would you say to them, listen, do you think it's fair that they should be CPI'd? In other words, the debt should continue to go up at a CPI rate or do you think as someone who deals with the community of people, your community, do you think it's something that should be eliminated as a uh, CPI increase? There should be no CPI increase? So what do you think? from my perspective, I guess there's two ideas to this. Theory of it increasing by CPI to me makes a lot of sense. So f- historically it's been relatively low. We know it's been between 2 and 3% for the last 10 years, which is really palatable. When you're taking on a hex debt, you don't really think about it, right? They go, would you like to hex or would you like to pay it up front? No one wants to pay it up front. The way hex and help debts have been sold to us, we just go, ah, oh, no interest loan. That's the best loan you can get in the entire world. However, I don't think a lot of people until this point have really considered what CPI means. I mean, I haven't really seen in our community over the last even four years them having conversations coming into June about what CPI will look like because I guess there's this idea of who cares about 2 or 3%, it doesn't matter. But when it increases to 7 that's when a few alarm bells go off because you go, actually, that's a lot of money. Wait, hold on, what does this mean for me? However, I mean, when you're talking about whether it should exist or not, I think in theory that makes sense. The government has lent money to us and they honestly, from my perspective, when I distill it down, they want to get back what they've invested. They're not trying to make bank or make a massive profit out of this. They just say, hey, Mark, if I've lent you 10 grand, we actually just want that 10 grand back with the same borrowing capacity or lending capacity or buying power of that 10 grand when you give it back. And we know that a dollar today is not worth a dollar tomorrow. So that just that just logically makes sense. However, because it was so high, I did have very high hopes that the government would step in and maybe freeze it. And we know that the Greens, they proposed that there was a freeze on indexation this year because they knew what that would mean. And we know that that is a significant blow. It's billions of dollars worth of indexation that are now going to be payable by people who arguably aren't in the highest end careers. When we look at the types of people who still have hex debts, they're the average Australians because if you've gone to university and you've done law or you've done medicine, you actually very quickly, once you get to a high six figure income, you pay back that hex debt really quickly because the percentage at which you pay it back is much higher than the average Australian. And that's great for them. I often see people in our community who are, I would say like a baby doctor or a baby lawyer on, you know, 150, they are paying it back within two or three years because of that 
percentage basis that they pay it back on. However, it's the average Australian that this is really impacting. It's not the rich of the rich. And then if you don't have an income, you're not paying hex anyway. So it's really at the moment impacting those people who are already impacted by CPI, making sure that they are paying more for groceries. It is people who are in circumstances where their mortgages are more and their bosses probably haven't given them a pay increase in the last two years because they can't afford it. So I feel like the world is a little a little bit tighter than it has been historically. And I guess that's where my opinion overlays the theory of should indexation exist? It makes sense. But when we overlay what's going on in the current economy and currently with our community, it's a lot more significant than that. And I think that we need to have theory and empathy come to kind of meet at a happy medium to work out what is best for our country, what is best when it comes to the politics of this. So it's, it's a little bit like what is the human impact as yeah. opposed to what the data, because you know, if I rely on data, tells me that the CPI has gone to seven percent. Therefore, I want seven percent back on the money that I advance you to gain your degree. By the way, the current CPI is not the interest rate that mm -mm. you'd be charged if you borrow money. I mean, that's like that would be the highest interest rate in the country um, by any by any bank. So it it sort of doesn't. To me, the human impact of what the Reserve Bank did the other day, uh, what the government's doing with, with indexation, we tend to, you use the word empathy, we tend to lack today enough empathy around what people are experiencing relative to what seems to be a logical truth when it comes to data. Data says 7%, I'm going to charge you 7%. Hang on, just pull back a bit here. I didn't know when I was doing this degree and you told me that you were, you advanced me the money that you, the government, will spend so much money during the COVID period and the supply chain globally and Ukraine war, et cetera, will create inflation at such a rate that we've never experienced before that you're going to be charging me 7% per annum on the debt that I undertook back four or five years ago. Exactly. When the world was a lot different. I was always happy to pay 2 to 3% if that's where inflation was or CBO was. But I never really agreed because you never told me. It's a bit like what the Reserve Bank did recently. Said we will never put, we won't put interest rates up into twenty twenty four. And what they also didn't say is, and when we do start putting them up in twenty twenty four, but they didn't say we're going to put them up eleven times, and four yeah. of those are going to be uh, fifty basis point increases. So they didn't say two things. The impact of the what the government does or doesn't say has a massive human outcome, and I, I just think we need to see more empathy by governments towards that. It'd be nice to see that in our May budget. Don't know if that's going to happen. Uh, it'd be nice to see the Labor Party or Dr. Jim Chalmers do something that sort of um, addresses these issues. But let's have a little talk about what you do in your life. That's what I'm really interested <laughs> we in. We can absolutely so, do that. Although I do love talking about interest rates and CPI we'll and how the it crap impacts out of everybody. people. That's the problem. <laughs> and and, and you, she's on the money, investing with she's on the money, she's on the money, take charge of your financial future. How the hell did you get into this territory and uh, writing books, doing podcasts, you know, running ma major socials, like really reaching a lot of women when it comes to millennials, I think is the word, but, but I don't know. You tell me your audience. Um, women in who are keen to understand about all things financial is probably a better way of putting it. If we're honest. Yeah. Accidentally. So my background is actually in psychology. So I saw that. Yeah, you're, so you're I have two degree. psych degrees and I adored doing it. When I started my psych degree, I thought I was going to go into child psychology and some type of clinical practice. And I guess hindsight is beautiful because it gives you, you know, 2020 vision. And if I look back, I guess the thing that I've always been driven by is genuinely having an impact. And I thought that if I do child psychology, I can help. If I thought I did clinical psychology, I can help. I learned very quickly that it takes a very special person to work in that space. And unfortunately, that's not me. It was too much of a mental load. I remember walking away from clinical trials and walking away from, you know, working in practice and placements and just thinking, this is not what I signed up for. So I pivoted from that in my final year of university and I thought, all right, I'm going to go into what's called organizational psychology, which is essentially the science of people at work. And I thought that's a better space. It's a bit more corporate. I'm going to jump straight in. And once I finished my two psych degrees, I actually got a job in management consulting and I worked in the space of culture and engagement. And I thought I'd made it, Mark. I thought this was the sexiest job ever. I had my $45,000 graduate salary. We were making it. 
I was so happy to turn up in a suit every single day and rub shoulders with all of the other men in suits. And I was a big dog, right? And the thing with that is when you're on a $40,000 salary and you are in a management consulting space, which is very arguably image driven, I went into debt very quickly. So I racked up about $42,000 worth of personal debt, which ultimately was crippling. How, how, doing what though? So I bought a car. No, I wish, I wish. So part of it was a car and I genuinely needed one. Everyone's going to justify their debt. So bear with me. I needed a car. I also, when I started my MBA, so I started my MBA when I was 23 because go hard or go home. And during that period, I went on exchange to do a few semesters in France. So I, I studied in the south of France. And at that point in time, I didn't actually have the funds to do that. So I borrowed money to study, to pay for the course fees because international travel often isn't covered. And I gave myself a really nice holiday at that point. I mean, I deserved it, right? So I had a holiday, I had a car, I had some international study. I also then just kept up with lifestyle. These things snowball. I was getting a coffee every single day at 10 a.m. when my colleagues went out and that's $5 a day. And while that doesn't sound like a lot to a lot of people, when you're on $45,000 and your debt repayment each and every single month for your personal loan is about 860 bucks, that very quickly makes things tight. I just did a quick calculation. There's nothing left, but Close There's to. really nothing left and you're living in a share house so your rent's really cheap but I remember my debt repayments were slightly more than the rent I was paying. So it's one of those things where it compounds and I didn't understand the financial world enough to know that was a terrible idea. So getting out of that debt was incredibly hard. I guess one thing led to another. I saw a financial advisor because I was out of debt and I just wanted to invest. I had my first $10,000 and I thought I was going to make it. I saw while working in organizational psychology, so many people that were saying, Victoria, it's not my organization or my engagement or the culture. Victoria, I'm just so stressed. My wife is pregnant with another baby and we just haven't financially planned for this. Or, oh, we've got mortgage repayments and we need a new car. And I just, in my head, when I was 22, 23, I thought that if you were a male in your 40s, you'd have it together. I could not conceptualize that my colleagues were stressing over mortgage repayments or still saving for a house or paying for their weddings. I just had this grand assumption that the second you became an adult and you got an adult job, everything sorted itself out. And that's not the reality of the situation right now. I'm an adult. I'm like, that was very, very living in a bubble. So I started to learn a little bit more about finance because after I saw that financial advisor, he actually was really awful. He basically said, Victoria, you don't earn enough money for me. You don't have enough savings. Like you're not my clientele. And it it was a bit more harsh than that. But I remember walking away going, wow, I really thought I was doing something for myself. I think it's really important you explain that. Yeah. Because, you know, generally speaking, financial advisors need to see a certain amount of assets of course. to make it worth their while to spend their time because they value their time at a certain rate, um, which actually means there's a lot of people who were ne- who never qualified, to get, will never be able to get financial advice. Yeah, so financial advice can be very prohibitive when it comes to cost because it genuinely does cost thousands of dollars to do comprehensive advice. So I worked for a number of years and had my own wealth practice in the Melbourne CBD called Zella Wealth and Zella would work. And honestly, our fees were anywhere between $4,000 and $8,000 for a statement of advice. And then ongoing fees were about the same every single year, depending on the client. They scaled up. Most of my clients, I guess, quite transparent about this, were sitting at the $1,200 a month mark when they paid me. So financial advice is expensive because there's a lot of risk in it, but there's also a lot of work. And I don't think that people comprehend how much work there is. Compliance work. Exactly. Compliance work. And post the Royal Commission, that compliance work has gone through the roof. So we're not just sitting down and going, Mark, how much money do you have? What are your assets? What do you own? What do you owe? All right. Yep. No worries. Let's make a plan. There's all of the admin in the background to file note that, to do the research, to do a number of different comparisons and present those comparisons and show you the right one. A statement of advice document these days is anywhere between 50 and 80 pages of size 12 font. That's a lot of work that I don't think people see coming, but that's a lot of work that I didn't comprehend as a 22, 23-year-old going into a financial advisor's office. I thought I was going to walk in, say, Mark, I've got 
10 grand. What do I do with it? I thought you'd tell me I was doing amazing. What do I do with it? I thought there would be a really easy outcome. So I guess, you know, that jumps forward a little bit. That's why I'm so wildly passionate about making finances more approachable and more accessible because we deserve that education. However, I guess that really started to prompt me into learning it myself. I was like, well, if he can't do it, who's going to do it? I have to. So I started learning more. At that point in time, I was doing my MBA and I really thrived in the accounting and finance finance topics. I adored it. I didn't know why though, but when I engaged my work that I was doing in that culture space and when I started to talk about finance, I just started realizing, wow, I could have an impact here. Like I started being that really annoying friend on the weekends. You'd go to brunch with me. And I'd be like, oh my gosh. So this week I've been doing super stuff. Mark, you actually have to do this. Sit down. So what you're going to do is you're super or what you're going to do is look at investing. And did you know the power of investing? So tell me, what do you know about compound interest? I was a pest. And my friends obviously got sick of that pretty quickly. And from there, I kind of decided, how am I going to channel this? What am I going to do? And I mean, lots of things come together. One of my clients when I was working in the culture space was a financial advisor. And I started going in and doing a lot of work because when you're in the management consulting space, you're seconded a lot into different organizations. I was seconded into his office and I never left. Um, oh, you stayed there. So I never left. So I actually quit my role and moved into more of a HR role with them because I realized wasn't a financial advisor at that point, but this is the space I want to be in. I can see how much impact this is having. I can see what this looks like. And because of the type of clients that my, you know, he became my business partner, because of the clients he had, I ended up having exposure to, I guess you would call it the ultra high net wealth space. So we're not talking, you know, mums and dads. We're talking people who have a minimum of $10 million investable. And also we were managing a couple of billion dollar family offices. So I wasn't just thrown into the financial advice space. I was thrown into that space where they're moving a lot of money. They're making a lot of big decisions. And I was still on 60 grand a year. So there was this juxtaposition of what my life looked like while sitting in meetings for family constitutions where you're arguing between, you know, the financial advisors and the family because the dad just wants their son to come home for Christmas and he's going to cut off the trust fund if he doesn't come home for Christmas this year because he keeps going to Mexico. And then I'm texting my housemate that I can't actually go out for Friday night drinks because I've got 43 cents in my bank account. <laughs> so there was just this massive juxtaposition of, the advice that they could pay for. And as you would know, Mark, I feel like there's this very, very big discrepancy between, uh, you would say the wealthy and the not wealthy. Wealthy ultimately continue to get wealthy because they're able to surround themselves with the right support, the right network. And a lot of that costs a lot of money. If you can afford the right advice, it's very unlikely that you're going to make a bad decision. Whereas if you are a mum and dad trying to start a cafe and you have no experience and can't afford advice on setting that up properly, your failure rate is going to increase. I could really see how the value of advice was being not missed, but not utilized by a community that couldn't afford it. So I just, I wanted to do something about it. And I mean, to cut a very long story short, ultimately I started to become quite disenchanted with making rich people richer. It just wasn't my vibe. Managing money was great. They'd come to meetings. I'd be telling them about their multi-million dollar investment portfolios and they'd be like, yep. Um, what time, what time did you book lunch? <laughs> and I just, I would work so hard and it was beautiful because they trusted me, right? And that's a sign of trust when they're like, Victoria, I don't care, like, you know, present it to me. Yep, great, do what you're saying you're going to do. And that that's nice, but I didn't really feel that impact of when I was talking to my girlfriends and they're like, oh, yeah, how exciting. I fixed my super. I didn't even know that was going to be an issue and I did the maths and I'm going to be so much better off. So that really, really inspired me. And so I started doing these sessions at lunch and they were lunch and learn sessions. And I was incredibly- With your girlfriends? No, no, not with my girlfriends. I was incredibly lucky that a lot of the clients that we had at the practice I was working at uh, were law, law partners. And so I said to them, can I have your contact details of your uh, HR team? They're like, yeah, no worries, no worries. And I went to HR and I said, I want your baby lawyers and I want them all in a room for a lunch and learn so I can teach them the basics of financial literacy. Because in my head, you know what baby lawyers become? 
big lawyers and big lawyers are very good financial advice clients if you want to create your own practice. Hopeless at investing in their money. Yeah, but they also, yeah, lawyers and doctors, awful at it, need the help, but they also make a lot of money. And when you're in financial advice, let's be brutally honest, they're the types of clients that can afford your fees ongoing. So to me, I was like, oh, maybe I could create my own practice one day and, you know, I'll start networking, I'll start growing it. And I realized very quickly that the women in those sessions wouldn't put their hand up and they wouldn't ask questions, Mark. They would just sit there quietly and they'd wait to the end of the session until everyone had left the room and then to be like, hey, V, didn't really understand that stuff about super. What did you say? How do I do it? And I just learned very quickly that especially women in very powerful roles didn't want to look silly in front of their male counterparts. So I wiped the men out of the room and I started doing my lunch and learns with women only and I called them She's on the Money. Ah. So that is where She's on the Money started. And from there, I created a Facebook group. So all my friends that I was making in these lunch and learn sessions could have a chat in this Facebook group. And one thing led to another and it compounded. So people would start messaging me and go, hey V, um, I know my cousin or my sister or my friend didn't do your workshop, but I think they get a lot out of the information that's currently in your like Facebook group. Would it be okay if I add them? Yeah, my friends, the more the merrier. And so from 50 people, it went to 100 people. And from 100, we went to 1,700. And I remember the day we were at 1,770 people because that was the day I thought, I think we should do a podcast. And the reason I wanted to do a podcast was because video, overwhelming. I'm not going to get in front of a camera. That is way too intimidating. But you know what I'll do? I'll do 12 podcasts of the basis of financial literacy from saving and money stories to, you know, how to start investing and thinking about it, your superannuation and your insurances. For me, that was all the tick boxes that you needed to have. 12 episodes, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, it should be done. What I didn't see is that would absolutely take off and we've now gone from that community of 1,700 people to a Facebook group of more than 250,000. We've now done more than 400 podcasts and we now have two main podcasts that we work on and we have about 1.6 million listeners each and every single month, which still continues to blow my mind. Well, that just goes to show you. I mean, and I, I, I presume they're mostly female. I mean, I, they I, are. I guess men aren't bad, but... Uh, the tone of voice doesn't play as well to men as it does to women. We obviously don't exclude anyone from our community, but you're right. 98% of our community members are female. And I would say most of our demographic, I think it's 72% sit between the ages of 25 and 34. So that's, I guess, where our community sits. If you're younger than that, we'll, we'll accept you. If you're older than that, we'll accept you. I don't care as long as the content resonates with you. Is the language for women in that cohort, that age co- cohort, is it different? No, absolutely not. So, well, the content is not different, but the... The language, the no. The language or the tone or... I mean, the tone that we use is me. It's my voice. It's the way I'm speaking now. I just speak to you very straight, very pragmatically. I would say that there's a lot of empathy in the way that I converse to begin with because of my background or because the way I create content isn't, oh, Mark, what's going on in the media? Let's do a presentation on it. I genuinely see something going on and go, how would my community feel about this? So I do think it is conveyed in maybe more of an empathetic tone, but it's not sympathetic. We're not feeling sorry for you. It's empathetic because far out, I know this isn't good. Whereas, oh my gosh, it must be so hard for you. We're not looking down. We're looking towards you because we're right beside you. I genuinely believe that the engagement from our community comes from the fact that I know you deeply because I am you. I am my community. I have been through this. I know how hard it was to save for my first home. I know what it looks like to have a mortgage repayment come out and it be a lot more than what you had anticipated. I've been in personal debt. And do you know what? It wasn't until maybe the last two years that I've been comfortable to share that with my community because I just carried a lot of shame about it. I was like, people aren't going to want to take advice from me if they knew I was in massive amounts of personal debt. And now obviously all of that has changed and my levels of financial literacy have obviously increased. I started my practice. I sold my practice. I'm now in the mortgage broking game and I I adore it, but I don't want people to feel like if they're brand new to this space, it's overwhelming. And we know that the financial services space likes to add a lot of complexity to it. 
LMI, for example, when we're talking about mortgages, if you've never heard of it and you've never learned of it, it can be quite confusing. But it just makes sense if you break it down into compartments that people can easily absorb and you explain it as a base level, right? 100%. I mean, uh, I don't know why the financial industry keeps using these uh, late LMIs and uh, LVRs and all that other DSRs, debt servicing ratios, all this. I think they do it to confuse everybody. And people like to talk in these sort of um, acronyms, you know, that, that it feels good. Um, people actually feel like they're smarter than everybody else. I feel uh, like when people talk in acronyms, it's because it makes them feel superior. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, or I know the territory, not- you don't. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's it's an authoritative thing. And I think that up until now, that has boded really well, because even now we're really kind of breaking down what personal financial advice means and when you need it and when you don't need it. And I think up until now, there's been this idea that every single person should have financial advice and it's expensive, but you should be spending the money. And my opinion is no, like there are actually a lot of people in our community that don't ever need a financial advisor, let's be honest. And or can afford it. Exactly. And and it it. might not even be about expense. It might just be about your income. There might not be a lot of wiggle room to do that investing or do that, you know, creation of wealth that maybe isn't even a priority to them because different people have different priorities and not everybody wants to be as rich as possible. Sometimes they just want to be able to put food on the table and that's good enough and that's okay. But my view is very much, I want to give you all the tools and all the resources to make the right decision for you. Whatever that decision is, I could not care less. But what I want to know is that you had the opportunity to become whatever you wanted to be. And I've been a part of that journey. Do you talk about things like, um, uh, like building portfolios um, and sort of having a so-called balanced portfolio. Do you talk? Do you talk about? Um, and what do you think about? Probably more importantly, about buying shares in in the stock market as part of a portfolio, getting ready for your retirement, or you know, just building some your super up. How do you approach those sorts of things, like the equity market, which, like to me, I don't like it. it gives me brain damage. I mean, I, unfortunately, I am in the equity market. I've got lots of shares, lots of different things because I want to have diversification. But I don't really enjoy it. I don't like it. Um, I don't really understand it because you never get full information. Um, I like bricks and mortar because I can actually see it <laughs> at the end of the day I, and I can work out whether it's going up or down. I know, I know what the levers are, whereas the equity market sort of more likely give me brain damage and it's probably the thing that I stress out about the most because I never pick it right. Well, how do you – How do you? I mean I, I can pretty much say if I go and buy that stock um, – be, be rest assured that stock's going to go down for a period of time because I, I because I tend to find these things out. I, I hear about them early but I don't tend to do anything until later and then I've got a, an advisor guy that buys them for me and uh, like especially lately, it's one one minute it's gold's up, next minute it's gold's down. Like, yeah. You know, it was, my God. And he just says, well, just hang in there, Mark. So how do you – when you talk on your podcast about the equity market – how do you approach it for your listeners? And not everybody's into the equity marks, I get it, but how do you approach it? So I think taking a step back from that, ultimately money is psychological. So it overwhelms you, but you love bricks and water. That is great. What we want to do before we're even having these conversations about the markets is step back and go, what are your values? What do you like? Because you're more likely to be motivated to be successful in an area that you're passionate about, that you like. I I guarantee you've made more money in property than you have in the share market because you understand it better. You're more motivated by it. It's way sexier for you to buy a house than it is shares. Whereas flip that round to me, my bread and butter has always been the share market and understanding that. And, you know, I was thrown in the deep end where I was forced to understand it when it wasn't my own money and now it is, I get it. And if you look at even my relationship, my husband loves property. He grew up, his parents made money in property. That was kind of how they invested. Whereas I only really knew shares when we got together. So we've come to this, I guess, happy medium of him saying, no, we really should be buying a house. And I went, oh, like, okay, I wasn't really thinking that. I have my wealth creation strategy over here. And I mean, everything's about compromise and we now do that. And we've bought a few houses and like that has been a part of our portfolio that I've struggled a lot with because I couldn't wrap my head around it. I mean, I have now quite obviously, but it's more, I I was not as educated in that space as I was shares. So I think it's about understanding your money values, what you want to create, what you're working with to begin with, and then going down that route. When we talk about creating portfolios, 
not every single episode that we create is going to be for every single person. So we've done mini series on property. I have an entire podcast called The Property Playbook on buying your first home, the A to V of getting into your first home, what you need, because not every single person can afford a buyer's agent to go out there and find the perfect property for them and and go down that route. So we're trying to make that more approachable. Whereas on the flip side, you might want to engage with the She's on the Money investing courses, or you might want to engage with the She's on the Money podcast that, you know, has a mini series of investing content where we go all the way through from what is a share to how to create a well-diversified portfolio and rebalance it yourself. So it's more about how do I give you the foundational skills and the understanding to understand when I'm talking about what a rebalance is. Because if I go straight into, well, it's really important to rebalance your own portfolio, you're going to go, what the heck? Whereas if I go, okay, cool. Well, once you've bought your shares, it's really important to have a look at it and make sure that you have, you know, equal amounts of all of them. And sometimes over 12 months, shares might perform really, really well or really, really poorly. And your portfolio might be returning an average, but we need to have a deep look at that and maybe bring them all back to the center. That's far more approachable and far more understandable for the average Australian who honestly does not care about the semantics or the acronyms or the complicated language of financial advice. Let's just make things even again. Oh, well, okay, I could probably do that myself. What does that mean? Well, maybe every couple of years you look at your portfolio and you sell off something that's been doing really, really well. We know it's been doing really well, but we want to take some money off the table, maybe put it somewhere else so that we can be consistent. Because from my perspective, I'm not trying to blow the lights out. I'm not trying to find the next thing. I'm not trying to say, oh my gosh, have you heard of crypto or have you heard of afterpay shares or have you heard of something that's going to be the next big thing? I'm very much about creating slow but sustainable growth that will ultimately change people's lives. And I don't think that that's too hard to conceptualize if I've given you those foundational skills. Nothing wrong with um, having a low risk profile. I mean, or not want to take risk. And of there's course. nothing wrong, by the way, being a risky person. Yeah, of course. And we've done entire episodes on what a risk profile is. I have a free risk profile tool on my website, so you can go and download it and see where you're at. But what I want people to understand about their risk profile is that the language around risk profiles can feel really overwhelming. So I would sit down and say, okay, mark my risk profile. It's aggressive. I'm an aggressive investor. You go, oh, hold up. What does that actually mean? Well, that means of my pie, of my entire investment portfolio, most of it is actually exposed to the share market. So if we're talking about shares, most of it's exposed to the share market. But what I always say is I'm a pretty conservative, aggressive investor. And that means that my portfolio might be 99% exposed to the market as opposed to someone who might be a conservative investor where only 50% of their portfolio is exposed to the market and the rest is sitting in things like high interest savings accounts or bonds. Mine's not there. Mine's in shares, but those shares are blue chip stocks. They are shares that are tried and true and tested and pay a dividend consistently each and every single year. They're not in a risky asset like cryptocurrency or like up and coming shares. I'm not interested in that space. So I think when we talk about risk profiles, a lot of people go, hold your horses. I'm not that aggressive. I'm not that risky. But when we dive into it, you might be very, very, very risky, but you also might be very conservative in in the way that you pick those assets that make up your portfolio. Somebody else could be a super aggressive investor and all of it's exposed to crypto. And that might scare the bejesus out of you and you're not interested in that at all. But on the flip side, I think it's really about understanding what a risk profile actually means and how much you're actually able to invest and actually able to put on the table. Why is it do you think that um, women in your age group that you talk to, your audience, who listen to your podcast and they follow you on all the various platforms, have all of a sudden become, well, maybe it's not all of a sudden, have become really interested in their financial future? Is it a new phenomenon? No. No, it's not new. But until now, I genuinely believe that the financial services industry has been gatekept by people who get paid incredibly well for what they do. And I mean, obviously, there's a lot to it. And this is a very flippant comment that I'm about to make. But if you knew exactly what an investment banker did, you would wonder why they got paid what they get paid. 
a lot of it is about network. A lot of it is about, you know, being able to use the, the software that they have access to and not a lot of it, if we're being brutally honest, comes down to pure intelligence. So I think it's about actually breaking down the ability to access these things and, you know, podcasts like mine, like My Millennial Money, I'm not the only one in this space doing this, make people kind of change their mindset and go, hey, this isn't actually that hard. But until now, when we talk about women and finance or women and having a career, it's as though we've been spoken down to, as though we don't understand it, as though maybe it's a bit too complex or maybe you should just let your husband do that because he might, he might be more into it. Finance isn't sexy when you look at it because it's numbers, it's whiteboards, it's computers. And I think there's this stereotyped idea that women should care more about the home and more about children. So we've been locked out of this conversation, but we're not silly. In fact, the research tells us that when we compare men and women in the investment markets, women perform better than men at picking shares and having better returns. And I think that says a lot about the level of empathy and the way that women approach things in general, because we're more likely to be considered and less likely to make a rash decision. So I think it's it's an interesting concept, but I think until now it hasn't been as easily accessible. And I think it should change. Is it a new concept? Absolutely not. I wish I could say that, you know, we're finally finding out what compound interest is. That information has always existed. But, you know, let's call it the last 20 years, financial literacy has been increasing because of the availability of finding it online. We haven't ever had a platform that means that the world is so open. So I think that that along with many other things in the world have become so much more accessible. Would you would you consider yourself evangelistic in relation to what your audience needs to know or what your audience actually would like to know about? I mean, because it comes across very evangelistic to me, um, which is cool. Um, do you feel like you're, you're cho- you have chosen this as a, as a thing that must be done? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's very strange. And I don't like the word evangelistic because like, that's just a really slippery slope to making my platform feel like a cult. But if people jumped on it, I think it's one of those things where I know the power of this. I know that women who take this advice, even if they don't earn more, if they understand budget and cash flow and they understand the power of their superannuation and they understand what all of this means, they're going to retire comfortably. And to me, that ultimate outcome, that's so special. Like the idea that women, it's not about here, we can all be rich, not the person that's going to jump up and down and say, here's how you create your next million dollars. Let's get up at 5am and have our bullet coffees and go, go, go. Like I'm not hustle culture. I'm very balanced when it comes to what do you want? could not care less what you want in all honesty. I love hearing about it. I love hearing that my community is achieving their goals, but isn't it awesome that they understand their goals and understand that pathway? So I genuinely believe everybody should have a level of financial literacy, but I also think that I'll continue doing this and I'll get on my little high horse and jump up and down about the importance of it until I'm no longer needed. I genuinely think this stuff should be taught in schools. And if it was, people would look at me and they're like, why is she trying to explain this concept that we learnt in grade five? And that's the ultimate outcome, I suppose. What about budgeting? I mean, where does budgeting fit into all this? Because you sort of talked about um, your experience when you were in, I think, France, you said, uh, you know, doing a, do, doing what you're doing over there and you probably weren't budgeting. Or, oh, no, it was not budgeting yeah. then. So what about that? I mean, where does that fit into all this? Because, you know, super is one thing. That's something that gets taken and you pay. You can't touch it anyway. And you might want to choose to self-invest, uh, self-manage that. But just outside of that, yeah. the money you earn each month after tax, what about budgeting? I mean, where does that fit in? Budgeting is a massive part of our community. I actually have a budgeting and cash flow online course that thousands of people have done and rave about. But I think it's it's interesting because the perception of budgeting is that it's restrictive. The idea that you sit down and look at the budget and go, oh, Mark, how much are you spending each and every single week on groceries? Oh, that's much more than the average. You should bring that down is relatively judgmental because from my perspective, I am a creature of convenience. I live a life that means I'm not home until late. So my grocery bill is quite high because the food that is in my fridge is basically already pre-made. I pull it out, put it in the microwave and I've had dinner and I can go to bed because I'm going to get up early the next morning for work. 
for a lot of families, they might see a lot of value in trying to budget and trying to, you know, meal prep. And I have one friend who can feed her family of four on $75 a week. And I'm always mind blown from that because I'm spending that every two days at least. However, those are aligned to my values. To me, that makes sense. But to a lot of my family and friends, it doesn't make a lot of sense to spend the money that I spend on things, but vice versa. Mark, I could not hate the gym more. People who go to F45 are spending 75, 80 bucks a week on this gym membership that I think personally is the biggest waste of money in the entire world. But that's your values. So I think it's about actually looking at what's coming into your account and then what's going out of your account and asking the question of whether you're comfortable with that. So if I look at my grocery bill, I'm super comfortable with that. But do you know how many subscription services I have signed up for that I just don't use? I think it'll be really fun to have Stan and Netflix and all of these other ones. I don't use it. So that's actually something that could be lifted out of my budget that doesn't impact my life. So I think it's really about looking at your budget more as a tool for understanding your value set and what's coming in and what's going out, because I genuinely believe we should put people in a position where they're in control of every dollar. Every dollar that comes into your account should be given a job. It might be a job to keep the world going. It might be your bills. It might be your expenses, but it also might be to save or to invest. It might be a dollar that is put into an emergency account where that money's job is actually to keep you financially secure, to mean that every time that something happens that was unexpected, you're financially okay. So I think it's more about your values and your goals and the life that you're building. Because I think a lot of people bury their heads in the sand about budget because they go, that's so overwhelming. It's so judgmental. I'm going to feel so bad about my circumstances. But if you sat down and said, all right, well, what are my goals? What am I trying to achieve? You might be saving for your first home. Oh, I really want to cut back on a few things because my goal of buying a home is so strong that I'm willing to sacrifice, you know, my convenience meals. I'll cook, I'll do something on Sunday, I'll organize all of that so that I can save a little bit more. But it's really a balancing act of working out how cash flow works because I think a lot of people in this world, you would understand how much money do you make each month? We know because it's on our paycheck, but not a lot of people understand how many dollars leave their account and why. And I think when we start looking at that and audit it, you kind of go, oh, actually I could change that or I could change this. And there's probably a lot of small things that you can change that don't impact your lifestyle, but do impact the way that you can save and invest and create the life you deserve. So it seems to me that you have, you might've changed tact with your psychology degree. It seems to me that you are using psychology. You've learned how to deconstruct complex um, concepts around finance and then reconstruct them in a way with language and uh, and by going a different direction to appeal to your audience. Do you, you probably are still a psychologist, but nearly a financial psychologist. I would love to see myself that way. Um, I do genuinely believe ultimately money is psychology, right? It motivates people. It demotivates people. It gives people anxiety. Like money, if we could take the emotion out of it, would be so easy. A plus B equals C where when we talk about money these days, I think money and psychology just go hand in hand, your values, your goals, how you feel about life, what you want to do. Ultimately, if we talk about property, a lot of people aren't buying property because they think it's a good investment. At the start, when you're saving for your first home, it's not because you're looking at it going, you know what, there's really great capital growth in that place. And if you send the rental yield, that's pretty sexy. Actually, I'd really like to achieve rental yield that looks like that. People aren't talking about that. They're talking about, oh my gosh, I want to save for my first home. I can get a dog. My husband and I love pets, but we don't want to have a dog until then. There's research that says millennials are buying property nowadays because they want pets, not because they want capital growth. There's literal research out there that says our value system has changed in the last 50 years. And I think it's so interesting that until now we haven't really talked about the fact that money is emotional. And if we, I guess, step back even further to things like childhood, money gives you that pit in your stomach. If you grew up in a world where, you know, money was really frugal and it was, you know, not supposed to be talked about when you become an adult and you're in your own relationship, your husband might bring up, oh, what about this bill? You get this overwhelming sense of dread because you're like, oh my God, we're talking about money. You don't realize why, but it was because you saw your parents argue about money on the daily when you were young. It's because you have this idea that money is bad and we shouldn't be talking about it and it's overwhelming and we probably don't have enough even once you do have enough. So I think that as adults, it's our job to reflect on that and understand it because on the flip side of that, 
it's also why a lot of people get in a lot of debt and a lot of trouble. And I mean, I didn't grow up in a super wealthy family. We were just a mediocre middle earning family, but I never experienced any money trauma. My parents were, you know, really good with money. We didn't really talk about it. I never went without. And I think that that means that my money story meant that I ended up in a circumstance where I got in a whole heap of personal debt because I was like, how bad it could be? Like, I've never been in debt before. I didn't understand that until I did it to myself. So I think that there's a lot to the story that ultimately is emotional and that drives our money decisions. It's why a lot of people are comfortable to invest thousands of dollars and why a lot of people hoard it and refuse to let it out of their savings account or even stash it under the bed because they've had experiences where they don't trust people or they don't trust the system. But all of that ultimately is psychological. And I think if we can work with the psychology of money, it's going to become easier for everybody. I like, I like, I like you to expand a little bit on this concept of um, values, your values or someone's values um, when it comes to, I mean, you just hit on an interesting one about millennials who might be interested in buying property so they can have a dog or a pet, um, which is sort of different to the way, way I was when I was in my t- early 20s about buying a property. Um, I bought a property in my 20s because that's what you did in your 20s. Those were the rules. You buy a property. You get married, you buy a property, you have kids, pay the mortgage off, work hard, blah, blah, blah. It was a process and, and that's what everybody was doing in my 20s and I'm, I'm going back a long time ago. Nearly, nearly, How much was your first property, Mark? My first property was forty-seven thousand dollars. And what were interest rates? Well, I think I borrowed, I borrowed my money from uh, Meriton. Actually, they just started, and uh, Meriton—you probably know who they are, but yeah, Meriton's a big company here in Sydney. But uh, and uh, Harry Triggerboff, we're talking about—we're um, talking nearly fifty years ago, um, and uh, I, the interest rate was nine percent. Hey, that's a pretty good interest rate. Yeah. That's not bad. I was, I was, and I sold it for seventy five thousand uh, three years later, so I was happy with that. But also got divorced, so I had to sell it. But uh, it, this marriage didn't last long. Um, so, but, but, but what was interesting for me at the time was um, relative to what you're saying now is it was never about values. Well, there was one value: security. You get secure. Buy. Make sure you're wife and if you have kids is going to be, everyone's going to be happy and secure now you're talking about different levels of values that I've never really thought through and I and I guess I'm not in my 20s so I don't know what people's values are but do you think there's been a shift in values of people who invest in the property market now absolutely there has and to be honest it's not our choice We didn't want our value system to change. It's the great Australian dream to have your own property, right? It's it's a given. And in your circumstance, it was a given. Those were the rules in the rule book that wasn't written that you followed. You get married, you buy a house, you have 2.5 kids and a dog. Like that makes sense because it was really accessible at that point. We know that, you know, 40 years ago, the average home was three or four times an annual salary. Whereas now to buy in Sydney, it's up to 17 times someone's annual salary. And while interest rates are slightly different, it's wild to think that the style of life that we had, so 40 years ago, the type of lifestyle we had, and you might have been earning, you know, $20,000 a year. And, you know, I've heard this from my parents. I've heard this from a whole heap of people around me. They're like, oh, well, I only earned this amount. And, you know, let's say it's, I only earned $25,000 a year and our property was $40,000. And like Victoria, you know, we it was different back then. But what was different back then was the style of life that you could live on that salary. You could have a more mortgage comfortably, you were able to afford your partner to stay home and look after those children without compromising the fact that you could drive down to the beach for a week once a year. You could have your family holiday. You could have a stay at home partner. You could have 2.5 kids and a dog, and you could also comfortably save for retirement. Maybe you bought a second property because you were investing in your future. That is no longer the reality of people in my demographic. I do not know people in my demographic who earn average salaries, who could afford a stay-at-home wife, a mortgage, 2.5 kids and a dog. It's not It's not feasible. So we have been forced to look at our values and what we want because there's a lot more compromise today than there was back then. And yes, it was very stereotypical back then and we could talk about you know, gender roles and expectations. Let's not have that conversation. Let's just look at it pragmatically. But now- People in that circumstance where they earn an average salary, 
it's very likely that if they stay single, they'll never buy property because it's not accessible. If they are in a couple, we've got to have these trade-offs. Do you want to get married? Do you want to buy a house? Do we want to travel? Because that trifecta, you can't pick all three. And I think that now, because of that circumstance, we're forced to look at, well, what are we picking? And that leads you down the conversation of, well, Mark, what's more important to you? Do you care more about your property? Do you care more about your relationship? Do you care more about traveling the world? Because unfortunately, we can't have it all. So I think that when compromise is is put in the face of you, you have to actually work out what that compromise is going to be. And I think that by guiding people down a garden path of, okay, well, let, let's actually look at what you care about. Let's put some blinkers on because it can be overwhelming to see other millennials or other people in your demographic buying a house you don't know how they've bought the house. You don't know if they have a guarantor or family wealth. You don't know if, you know, they actually have a far higher paying job than you actually understand. You don't know if they're absolutely crippled by that mortgage repayment. But we always look at other people and with the rise of social media, I think that it's a highlights reel. It's glorified. Like, don't get me wrong. I posted a picture on the day that my husband and I, or my, at that time, boyfriend and I bought a house together with our little sold sign because I was so excited. But what you didn't see was how many times I'd cried during that process, how many times my partner and I had fought over what our budget was going to look like, fought over the compromise of I wanted shares and he wanted property and what's a better investment? Should we be buying an apartment? Should we be buying a house? Like you don't see the journey. You only see the highlights reel. And as much as I try very hard to share both, you're still only going to see the highlights because I don't want you to tune into the bad stuff. I want you to tune into the good stuff. I've got something to share and something to celebrate. So I think it really forces us down this path of well, what are your values? Do you actually want what that other person has or do you want to create your own reality? And well, if if you create your own reality, what does that look like? So I don't think it's about, you know, not having thought about our values back then, but there was this idea that we could kind of have it all back then because our income enabled us to do that. And I was doing some research on what I guess the average salary then looked like, because you look at it and you go, well, what, what's $25,000? In my head, that's a lot of money. But if you look at, you know, CPI and indexation and how much things cost these days, an income, I think it's about 50 years ago, an income of $25,000 enabled you to have the same lifestyle today that a $350,000 income gives you in today's world. That's very big. That's a very big difference. The fact that you would probably need a $350,000 individual income to buy a property, have a stay-at-home partner, have your kids, get them through a good schooling system, have a dog and go on a holiday each year, that's the reality of it. But back then that income did that for us and it was normal. If you're talking or when you talk to your millennials and let's say we're talking a single female millennial, someone between 20 and 30, and uh, she's thinking about what should I be doing for my should I be should I be looking at um, investing my or, or taking control of my super? You know, I'm getting a X amount of dollars put away every every month in, out of my salary by my employer. What do you say to her? I'm going to be really fluffy again. It goes back to values. It goes back to what you want. I think these days with the investment options we have, we do need to think about whether we want to invest in an ethical fund or a non-ethical fund. How much involvement do you want to have in your superannuation or how much involvement do you not want to have? I think it's really easy to work out what type of super fund you have. So first things first, I genuinely believe that it's a hygiene factor to kind of set that up every couple of years check in and make sure that it's doing what it needs to do. Make sure you don't have multiple because we don't want to be paying fees on multiple different accounts that are just going down the drain. So hygiene factor aside, you can actually compare it. So there's a government-based website that essentially is called MySuper and you can compare it now. It's not, it's not a It's a government-based website, which means you can compare apples with apples and look at the top performing funds and the bottom performing funds and just check in where it's at. Where your fund is at. Where your fund is at, exactly, and maybe make a change if that's what you're up to. But I think that a lot of people would look in those circumstances at the fees and go, oh, the cheapest fund mark. But sometimes when you're paying peanuts, you get monkeys. So we need to look at whether the fees are good for the performance that it's achieving and whether you're comfortable with that. It's a net outcome. Exactly. And as you would know when it comes to having a balanced portfolio and it comes to, you know, assisting uh, when it comes to assessing your risk, your risk might be a balanced portfolio, 
ultimately that's going to have a lower return than an aggressive portfolio. So you really need to understand not only what fund you're with, but what portfolio have you chosen and what does that return look like? I think it's a hygiene factor to just check in, make sure it's in the right place. And to be honest, I just don't ever trust the account that your employer has just set you up with. Nobody is going to care more about you individually than you. Your employer is just, again, as a hygiene factor for them, making sure that you have access to super because they are obligated to pay it. So let's just find a spot that we can put it. And sometimes they just pick the easiest option. That does not mean it is the best. Because a lot of younger people have no interest in the money that gets put away in the superannuation they just, because they don't see it. They out of sight, out of mind. They don't think about it and they just think it's going to take care of itself. But outside of that, mm-hmm. the money you earn, do you talk to millennials about being conscious and purposeful about outside of their budget, what's left over and what they do with it? Yeah, I am. And I am because... I am because superannuation, from my perspective, really sexy. It is the closest thing we have to a tax haven in Australia. It is 15% tax. And for people who is, are especially on that higher marginal tax bracket, that looks really good. You can basically get what we would call an instant return because of that difference between your marginal tax bracket and that 15% super. So in some circumstances, that's an instant return of 23 or 24%. So that that's a good start. And I think that's why it motivates a lot of people to go, oh, I'll pop it into super. It's a bit of a money win. However, the thing with the superannuation environment is that is locked away until your retirement. And for a lot of us, we want to create a level of financial freedom before the age of 65. And I do genuinely believe that the government is going to increase the age of accessibility of your superannuation to 70 at some point in the next 10 years. And I think they're going to do that because of our aging population and the fact that, to be honest, at 65, most average Australians don't have enough money in there to have a comfortable and safe retirement. So there's a lot to have a conversation about. But for me, I don't want to wait until I'm 65 to have financial freedom. So I look at my superannuation as a really good future planning asset. I look at it and I I personally don't add any more to my superannuation because I would love that financial freedom earlier. And while I can see that there are very good benefits to, you know, maxing it out and, you know, making a very big decision about that and throwing all your money in there because it's, quote, the best return. For me, the best return is often the thing that's going to give me the most freedom. And knowing that I'm creating an investment portfolio outside of a a system that stops me from accessing it, I think that for me personally, growing my wealth outside of super is very, very important. For some people though, they might go, well, I don't really care. I've got different strategies. I'm buying property outside of super. I'm going to max my super out because I've got the free cash flow. You do you. It's more about understanding what you want to get out of it because there's going to be nothing more disheartening than getting to the age of 50 and being like, my God, I am the best investor. I have done such good work. Look at my super. I have so much super that I could have a passive income tomorrow of 150 grand. That's so good. I could retire on that. A lot of Australians are in that position, but you can't do it because you can't access your superannuation until you're 65, so go back to work. So for me, it's about what type of freedoms do you want? And I'm sure at some point I'm going to start stuffing cash in my super because I might have that free cash flow and it just makes sense to do that. But if you're making a decision about accessibility, I think we need to understand how that could impact you long term. And I think a lot of people don't care about their super because they don't think it's their money. They think it's, you know, it's the government's money. It's, you know, not mine, out of sight, out of mind. I can't access it till I'm 65. Why would I care? But talk to someone who's 64 who hasn't cared about their superannuation, about whether you should care or not. And I think you'll come to a very quick conclusion that sorting it out right now is a priority. Yeah. So, and it seems to me, Victoria, that a lot of your thing here is is about building awareness and understanding as opposed to advice. You, you're not really saying do this or do that. No. But just understand what you're doing and why you're doing it, which is the values piece. So, you know, what are your values and therefore which way are you going to go about it relative to trying to achieve the values that you're, you start off with and, and, and work the system. I, know, I agree. Work the system somehow. Victoria, it's been way too long you and I getting together. Um, I've enjoyed this a lot. I, I'm going to ask you to sign these books for me if you don't mind. Of course. Later. So what got, an honour. Uh, no, not an honour. I'm an honour. <laughs> it's an honour for me to be given them and to have the signatures in them. So she's on the money. 
take charge of your financial future. I quite like that. And uh, investing with she's on the money, build your future wealth, which is the early one of these two. So the pink one is the first one. The yep. green one is second. And you'll be very excited to hear there is a blue one coming out in October called Property with She's so on the Money. So you can do money. a property one. Of course I am. Oh, that's great because there is a – Australians have a uh, preoccupation with property. It's the great Australian dream. <laughs> they have a – it's yeah, sort of slightly becoming a little less than the great Australian dream. Right now it's a bit of a nightmare for a lot of people. <laughs> too but true. Ho- hopefully that doesn't last too long. And, uh, and, uh, and all those people who are struggling at the moment in relation to their mortgage, hopefully they – that gets resolved within the next 12 months with a few interest rate reductions. But Victoria Devine, thanks very much for coming today. It's been bloody awesome. Thank you so much for having me. A pleasure.